Rob Bradford, good morning, my oh, friend. I could listen to you talk about your house all day long. Who Curtis. couldn't? I mean, I, and, and the first thing that you do when you buy a house like that, you know what you do? You call McFarland. That's exactly what you do. You do that we, exactly. We need McFarland, and <laughs> you know what we need? We need to get some room for Shohei downstairs. I'm going to bring James upstairs, and we're going to get him here. I saw these yesterday. The Red Sox, 25 to 1 odds. There are about 14 teams ahead of them. What are the legitimate chances that the, the, the Boston Red Sox are engaged in any way in trying to obtain Shohei Otani by August 1st? Uh, whatever is a lot more than 25 to 1. It, it is I, I, it's not, it's not going to happen. It 50 is, to 1? It is, no. Keep going. Keep going. To one? Keep going. How one much did, you, how, how much did you say Curtis's house was worth? Whatever yeah. that is. Okay. And, to 1. Oh, uh, but uh, so you have to go back to when, when Shohei first came here, right? The Red Sox, obviously, like a lot of teams, were really, really enamored with Shohei. They make up the Celtics jerseys, the Bruins jerseys, the Patriots jerseys with a toddy on the back. They are ready for this meeting, and they never get a meeting with him. He never allows the Red Sox to get their foot in the door. He takes all West Coast teams, with the exception, I think, the Cubs and the Rangers, um, but I think that you have to start there in terms of how he views his next landing spot mm -hmm. or where he wants to settle in. And, um, and you know, and then I know he wants to win, but it's not like the Red Sox definitively are going to win either. I mean, no team is definitively going to win, but still you want the, like the Dodgers, for instance, they would have, if you talking about the history of winning in recent years, Shohei would probably lean toward them more than more than most. So, but I saw a thing, uh, yeah. Bradford, that the Dodgers were, are not going to be able to do it. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't believe that. I mean, they they've been freeing up money for a little bit mm -hmm. for this year. So, I, I think that any team on the West Coast is is probably going to do their best to get this guy. And Seattle being at the top of the list, I mm -hmm. think he, he, as he said, he has his home in Seattle. Now, hey, listen, it was a lot of fun watching Kenley Jansen try to recruit Shohei Itani at the All-Star game. Right? What, what's, Kenley did his darndest to do whatever he could. He talked to him. He talked about him. He did everything he could. But still, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be location. I think it's going to be about winning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I just did a podcast, the Baseball's Boring podcast with Jeff Fletcher, who wrote the Otani book. And he said, he covers the Angels. He said, don't discount the Angels. Because what you have to do going to the deadline here, if you're the Angels, you have to say, this is our best offer. And get an idea if he would sign there. And if he doesn't sign, then trade him. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they might not trade him suggests that they think they can sign him. So, Bradford, does that mean, all right, this is kind of like a Tupac question. If you trade for him, then you get him, get him, and then maybe you can change his mind to move to the East Coast. Or do you just wait till free agency and then what I think the Red Sox should do is go above and beyond what everybody – if somebody offers them $600 million, you offer them $675 million. Is it, Which avenue would you go in if you're the Red Sox to potentially get this guy? Do you go above and beyond in free agency money-wise or do you make a move to try to get him? Well, first of all, they aren't this the way that they're doing business these days. Mm -hmm. They are not going to allocate resources, prospects, whatever you need to for a couple months of Otani to say, "Hey, you come in, and we're going to show you the seaport." Here's Greg Hill. Let let us him host you for a mm -hmm. couple of days. And that's not how it's going to work. They they just won't do that. Now, when you talk about free agency, about blowing him away, well. For, there's going to be a lot of teams that view them that way, and there's going to be teams that are doing it a lot more um, prevalently. They're, they're doing it a lot more than certainly the Red Sox are. The Red Sox in past, maybe, sure. You know, you outbid everybody by $40 million for Carl Crawford. You bid everybody outbid everybody by $40 million for David Price. Mm -hmm. But they don't do it that way anymore. But Steve Cohen of the Mets, he does. The Padres do. The Dodgers potentially can. The Yankees, they probably would. So I think that there's other teams that are more willing to go down that road. Bradford, let's talk about a guy who's on the team right now. Pavetta's numbers have been great. Uh, what's it going to take to get him back into the starting rotation, and what do you think's been the massive change in him? I think that 
for, I think he's going to go back in the rotation because they've just run out of times where you can do the two two uh, openers in a row thing. You just can't keep doing that. And he's also reached the point where he's been so good. You need a starter. And if you have this guy who can go six innings and do what he's been doing, then instead of getting uncomfortable and trading, paying basically a tax, because if you trade for anybody right now, teams are going to gouge you. So instead of going down that road, fill in that gap with a guy that you already have in Nick Bavetta, and I think that's what they're going to do. And, and to answer your court, question, Courtney, about why he's doing this, I think he just went out there, and, and I heard you play the sound of Alex Cora. I think he just goes out there, doesn't worry about pacing himself, and pitches with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. Boom, boom, boom. You know, he, his stuff is really good. He's got he's got a great fastball. He's got a good curveball. And he's just letting it fly. And we saw it last night. This is what happens. He has the potential. He has the skill. Now it's just sort of manifesting itself in actual results. Yeah, I would say last night was the best performance from Pavetta since the interview he had with me in Springfield. Oh, my. I mean, I think that ultimately I, it, it took a little bit for that to take root, Chris. Right. But I felt like that will always be his motivation, that, that back and forth. I, I will say this. I, I think that probably if he had a heart rate monitor, it would measure the heart rate would measure about the same of that interview as his performance last night. That's how jacked up he was in both situations. Right. I would say I had as much to do with Pavetta's success last night as the show's 50% ratings increase has had since Jackson joined us last July. Oh, and by the way, can can we check the algorithm how many people have been searching and how to steal a baseball isn't boring sweatshirt? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. I, mean, that's I think the, he's that's... wearing that today, by the way. <laughs> he is. <laughs> oh, he is? Yeah. Oh. Wait, wait, wait a second. Now, so this, this opens a whole nother door right. because I heard you guys talk and I heard Jackson and I assume that he's a truth teller, but that puts some doubt in my mind because he told me he gave it to his dad. Mm -hmm. So unless he's raiding his dad's closet, mm -hmm. like there's, uh, we, we gotta, we gotta get Jackson on the straight. That has here. happened before Bradfo, but no, this is my regular old red swing juice sweater. Not, not the baseball isn't boring sweater. Oh, okay. All right. My well. dad is happy in that and he, he loves no. it. Listen, your, your dad must be very proud of you for stealing his clothes from yes, him. So well, there you, you know. go. Well, Bradfo, send us some swag, man. As baseball yeah. isn't boring. I, 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 I just told, I just told Chime today. I, I literally I was driving to the station because I it, with my entire back seat filled with T-shirts. Okay, with, and and then uh, like you said, uh, weather is a problem, and evidently traffic's a problem <laughs> because I had to turn around and bolt home to do this. Yeah, sorry Br guys, Bradford. When you look at this Red Sox team and you look at kind of where they are in the standings, and I know we've kind of been talking about this, and I I feel like baseball is such a it's one of those sports where. If you can get into the postseason, it really doesn't matter what seed you are because there's not one dominant team that has proven they could do it in the postseason like a Golden State in basketball or like a Kansas City in football. When you look at where they are right now, the Red Sox, do you believe this team has a realistic chance of making the postseason? And if they do, can they make some noise? And do they have to add some pieces to make that become even more uh, of a reality? Yeah, so I, I, I've said this a few times. I think that you know if they could get their their stuff right, and they have, then you should go for that third wild card because the third wild card plays the first place team in the Central, which would be Minnesota or Cleveland, and they they aren't that good. So right out of the gate, you get to play them. You can beat them. You'll probably be, be the favorites when you play them. And to answer your question, is should they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because of that. Because, the, as you said, I totally agree with you. In the American League, there's no team where you say you can't beat them. The Rays, the Rays are almost out of first place. They're only a game up on Baltimore. So there's no team in the American League with this Red Sox team as they are playing right now, like you said, maybe add a few pieces here and there that you couldn't compete with whatever team you have to play in the playoffs. And in terms of what adding pieces from what I understand what they're wanting to add is, is maybe a back of the rotation starter and a right-handed uh, relief pitcher who could probably pitch in the seventh inning. So you just add something because you have these other guys coming back. You have uh, uh, the best case for scenario for up and down this roster in the last couple of weeks, Duran, Yoshida, Turner, whatever it is. 
And so you have this team. Yeah, I think you can make a run. Yeah, go ahead. When making that run, when you look at the guys that are hurt and were ex- are expected to come back, who's the most important uh, that can really make a difference for this team? Oh, I, I think, well, I would say Sale because if he if you get the Sale that you had when he was on a run, I think probably him. But as Cora said, and as you guys know, you can't really count on that anymore. But if you said if you're going to get that guy back, yeah, I mean, top of, he's the top of the rotation pitcher. Absolutely, that would be the guy. But Trevor Story, the Trevor Story, the good Trevor Story for these rules, the way that baseball's being played now, this is a guy that can make a huge, huge impact. Go back to 2019. He was one of the best shortstops in baseball defensively. He's one of the best base stealers in baseball in terms of being efficient. So if you get that guy, then, yeah, I mean, I think that that could make a huge, huge difference. But, Cordy, I think that Chris Sale is probably still the – if you get the Chris Sale that you had before, that's the guy. So, Rob, what would you say today, four years in or so, with Heim Bloom? Are you more buying in because of the way the July has gone? Where is your – if you had to say that the future of the Red Sox is secure with – it felt like a month ago that Heim and, and Cora were on the hot seat and that both could be gone. Now they've had the best July in baseball – they're entering the deadline in a little bit of a position of, of power. Where are you on Heim Bloom going forward uh, today? I think it, it, it has always come back to it's a results business. I, I don't buy into the whole, oh, the farm system's so much better, and so you got to be patient. Um, I don't buy into, like, you're just going to have to trust, like, this not like going out and getting the, the, the foundation guys, the guys that you sort of know what you're going to get. That's absolutely going to work. I can't give him the, there's no benefit of the doubt there, but it's results business. But I will say this, Chris, is that because of it's a results business, if it keeps going like this, where the moves that he's made, I said, best case scenario, we kept saying 2023 Red Sox, maybe we didn't know what they were for months upon months upon months. Well, as we sit here, all of a sudden you have a lot of these things, which they thought this could work. If this happens, well, it is happening. You know, whether it's Duran, whether it's Casas emerging, whether it's Justin Turner doing what he's doing, Yoshida. I mean, a lot, we can't ignore that a lot of these things that they thought were going to happen are actually happening. But still, you got to get to the end of the year. Whether or not they make the playoffs, I think is a big, big deal. Ask me that question then. Bradford, the one thing that concerns me, and I don't know how you feel about this though is do they take the approach as, because you brought up Story, you brought up Chris Seale, do they go with the approach of like, oh, those are our trade, or not trade, uh, our deadline acquisitions? No, I don't I don't think, I think they make moves. And okay. I, like I said, I think that what they do, it's, it's not going to be like, I don't think you're going to have like the Lucas Giolito. I don't think you're going to have these shock and awe the, where you have to give a top prospect for, but... You, I think they're going to make, a, uh, like I said, a righty reliever who could potentially pitch in the seventh inning, who preferably has written a book with me, um, and also, <laughs> and, and also, I think that, that you know you're talking about a starter, a back of the end of the rotation starter, and really, if you go back 2021, they got a couple relievers, useful relievers in Hansel Robles and Austin Davis, and they gave up nothing for. They really gave up nothing for Schwarber because he had a hamstring issue, mm-hmm. I- injury, so. Uh, you, talking to Chris Martin the other day, a guy who has been a pl- through plenty of trade deadlines, had been parts of trade deadline moves. He said, "Just even the littlest move goes a long way in that clubhouse. Uh, it says it sends a message to everybody. It says we are going to go for it because last year when they trade Vasquez, right or wrong, the perception among some of the key guys there was we're going the other way." Make a move. Don't take away guys. Add guys. You'll send a message. I like the name Lucas G. How did you say that? Giolito. Yeah. I like that. That's a good name. Get him. Yeah. Well, let's the, go. Paisans. A I good mean, it's baseball gonna, name. It, it's going to cost you more for the name, but, you know, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, stay away from the North End late at night. Rob, uh, thank you as always. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. All right. See you all later.